I just wanted to say a big congratulations to my girlfriend's sister, who has just given birth to her second daughter. Oh, congratulations. I thought you were going to say to Adam for getting his paper into review, but I haven't told you that. You have told me that. I haven't. You told me that you got it into review and then... Oh, well, I was lying then. It only went in yesterday. Oh, you, well, you said that you'd submitted it. And I yeah, said, I had, yeah. And I but said... it can get rejected. 60% do. Oh, so it has... It's been approved. What's the baby called? <laughs> They've named her Thea. Uh, no. Yeah. Not like the moon. Oh, no, like the... Oh, God. She's the goddess of the light of the bright blue sky. Oh, she's half of the Earth. Yeah, it's also the name of yes. the planet that collided with the early Earth. Are they generic drift fans? Is that where it's come from? Yeah, exactly. They clearly are big fans of the podcast. Yeah, wow, well, there we go. First first baby name. Yeah, I know. Really cool, isn't it? Yeah. So thanks very much to them for naming their baby after a topic that we discussed in the podcast. How was your holiday to Greece? It was lovely weather. And amazing sort of geography, yeah. you know, the geology in Crete. I saw a picture of your, um, a crystal, a mystery crystal. Yes, I thought it was um, some quartz, some crystals. They were just on the coast. So the, the way that, the, that Greece is, it's so volcanic and, um, you know, active geologically that there's just strata sticking out all over the place and you're just constantly finding all those layers of different types of rock. It's beautiful in that respect. Mm. And um, along the coast, there were these uh, just patches of this sort of clear, milky crystal and veins of it running through the rocks. So I thought it was quartz. Somebody commented to say that they thought it was something else. I'm not not sure what it was. I don't really know that much about geology, to be honest. Yeah. Did you do hashtag crystal to get the crystal people involved? I don't really want to get the crystal people involved. Well, they're, they're going to know which crystal it is. Uh, they might. They might, yeah. The people who think that they have healing properties. Oh, no, I didn't mean those crystal people. I, d- I, I didn't tag the crystal people, so I don't know what it is. I, I'll put it in the show notes and maybe one of our listeners might be able to help identify it. Yeah, if, if you're a crystal person. Mm, a crystallographer or whatever they are. <laughs> Not that. <laughs> no. So I was in Crete. And it's my first trip to Greece. I've never been to Greece before. Mm-hmm. And it's a great place sort of culturally. It's not one of the best um, sites in Greece for archaeology. Mm-hmm. But they do have a Minoan palace, mm-hmm. which is the supposed site of the labyrinth that housed King Minos's Minotaur. Yeah. Um, and the ruins. So we visited the ruins. and It's amazing. This huge palace. And they're from around 1700 B.C. Um, it's really, really old. One of the first, I think, civilizations of Europe. Such an old building. It's so grand and sophisticated. There were like paintings and thrones. They even had sewage and freshwater pipes, like ceramic pipes. And they would get fresh water pumped in from um, like a spring, like 11 kilometers away or something. Mm. It was absolutely amazing. They even had a flushing toilet. That sounds very luxurious. I know. It was amazing. It was it was incredible. We, we I'll admit we mainly stayed on the beach when I went to to Crete. You oh, know? you've been to Crete as well? Oh yeah, I've been to Crete. Oh, okay. On like a family holiday as a child, but I didn't see any minotaurs mm. or minotaurs supposed lairs. Mm. Well the minotaur apparently this is what the guide told us. They they believe that it, it evolved from this idea where the Minoans used to have a sport which was called bull jumping and it was a very dangerous sport where you grabbed a bull by the horns and flipped over its back as it was running towards you. Um, Mm -hmm. So that eventually killed lots of girls and boys or whatever and then that evolved through legend into this beast in the labyrinth at um, at Crete. Yeah. Um, I also went to the cave where Zeus was apparently born. Zeus was born on a cave. He was born in a cave. In Earth? On Earth? Yeah. I've got both of those words the wrong way around. I meant on Earth the first time and I said on a cave. <laughs> yeah, Zeus's father, Kronos, who is Saturn, mm. he devoured all of his children when they were born um, because he himself had cut off his father, Uranus. He'd cut off his father's testicles, okay, um, which flew to, well, fell to Earth. 
and that's where Aphrodite came from. Aphrodite like was born from one of the testicles. <laughs> um, and the Greeks, or the, the, the mythos goes, that whatever you do to somebody will happen to you. What goes around comes around, essentially. Mm -hmm. They had that. So Kronos was terrified that his son would do the same to him. So every child he had, he ate. And the final child that he was going to have was Zeus. And Zeus's mum, I can't remember her name now, um, she gave Kronos a stone to eat or a big rock to eat, but dressed it up as a baby. Mm. And he ate that instead of eating Zeus. And then she went and hid Zeus in this cave um, that I visited. Okay, it doesn't really make sense though, does it? No, none of it makes because, sense. Because, no, why would he eat all of his offspring if his fear was he was going to get his balls cut off so he couldn't have any more offspring? Like, <laughs> either way, you're getting no offspring. You're only getting your balls cut off. You're still alive. Yeah, but you're, you can't... You're a planet. You can't have the hanky-panky, right? Of course you can. Neutered cats and dogs still do. Do they? Yeah, they love it. I don't think they do. I don't think you can get a... Um, I don't want to use this word on a podcast like Generic Drift. An erection. Hmm. I don't think you can. I, I think you might... Okay, I think we should Google this because I don't want you spreading misinformation about people with no testicles. All right, I'll Google it now. Can you get an erection if you have no testicles? No testicles. It says, having one's testicles removed need not diminish or reduce sex drive or erections. Well, there we are. But because the testicles produce male hormones, men who have lost both of their testes may experience a reduction in sex drive and difficulty in getting and or maintaining an erection. Well, so that means absolutely nothing then. Oh, no, sorry. Having one testicle removed need not diminish or reduce sex drive. Oh. But having both, you might have... May. Yeah, may. So, okay, fine. <laughs> the first <laughs> search result for that is Cosmopolitan. Well, a page titled "My Boyfriend Has No Balls." See, still got a girlfriend. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's all nonsense, anyway. But it's yeah. interesting nonsense, and it was cool to see. It was cool to see the cave where it was. This apparently happened. You know. Mm -hmm. So, how have you been? Well, I'm very excited. What are you excited about? I've had a business idea. Oh. Now I know. We, when we lived together, we would often come up with little business ideas. Mm. I know it's, you know, you would really like to be a, be a businessman, you know, be a Lord Sugar type figure. <laughs> Lord Sugar type figure. Yeah, I, I would. I, I like business. I'd like to have my own business one day for sure. Yeah. But I don't really know what, what, what I'd be doing. Well, I feel free to steal this idea if you're willing to put a lot of work into it and, you know, give me a little bit of money. Okay. When it when it's making money. We're about to revolutionize the industry of hairdressing and barbery. Okay. With a new app called Trimda. Trimda. Yeah. So what does Trimda do? It so it basically is a service for matching up the hairstyle you want with a person who is qualified based on like customer reviews to do a similar hairstyle. Like under the hood, it would all be AI, but it would just sort of be like a, a Pinteresty sort of system where you swipe or you, you choose or upload a picture of a hairstyle like you want it. And it searches through the database of hairstyles that have previously been done and matches you up or like lists the hairdressers in your area um, based on how, how good they are at that particular style. Okay. There would be demand for this. I yeah. agree with that. And so you could book it on the app and have them come over to your house, or it could also uh, work in a salon where, like, you just put yourself as available if there was no customers in the salon and you were looking for a more passing trade. Yeah, okay. Okay. I 100% would, would download this. Yeah. Because I never get the haircut that I want. Mm -hmm. Never. 
I always ask for a particular type of haircut and nobody's ever able to do it. And I don't know why. So if I could upload a picture yeah. and then find somebody, maybe look through previous haircuts that they'd done. Well, that, that is what it would be. So instead, when their profile popped up, it it wouldn't be like, you know, just a picture of them. It would be Peace Ball's face is blurred out. Like part of the contract would be that once you do someone's hair, you have to upload a, pi- an, a picture of it that gets anonymized. Anonymized. Okay. Yeah. So like your face swirled or whatever. Mm. The, people might not want the faces uploaded. Mm. Um, and that, so then you can look through previous examples. Mm. Would people be rating the people that would cut their hair as well? Yes, but it wouldn't be phrased like that. So it wouldn't be as if if you gave someone a bad rating, it would be a reflection on their quality of a hair as a hairdresser. It would be the quality of that haircut compared to the haircut that you're after. Like okay. you're rating the cut, not the person. Okay. So just if somebody got a hundred percent rating on crew cuts, then you know you were your hairdresser pulled out of your wedding at the last minute, and they were the closest person, and they just came over and like ruined the haircut you wanted. It wasn't a good match. Then that wouldn't reflect bad on their score for crew cuts. It would reflect bad on their score for wedding hair. Oh, okay. Okay. How would how would you do that? Oh, AI, AI. Okay. AI, AI. Listen, this is for the, the boffins to figure out. Yeah. I'm just the ideas guy. <laughs> I, don't, I don't fine tune. I'm just after like a quick investment and then I'm out. Okay. You might have a good answer to this actually because you've got quite a bit of primate experience. <laughs> yes. How do we test whether an animal has the capacity to recognize itself? Ah, okay. So you might know the actual way. Well, we used to have some... When I worked at a monkey sanctuary, we had some researchers from the University of Portsmouth who were doing facial recognition in Mm -hmm. the uh, Barbary macaques and the rhesus macaques. And what we used to do is they would train them up. They'd have a screen in front of them. Mm -hmm. and they would they'd show one image and it would be they'd start off with like a shape of a circle and then they would um put up like another image of like a circle a square and a triangle and if the monkey touched the circle it would get a treat Mm -hmm. so you started off with very simple um shapes and then moved on to different facial expressions in the monkeys okay so you would have um, a picture of a macaque looking angry, and then you'd be the macaque would be presented with angry macaque, happy macaque, confused macaque, or whatever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, <laughs> if they touch the thingy one, so that was how they did sort of facial recognition, and they worked out that macaques were very very good at recognizing even human, I think, mm-hmm. facial patterns. Yeah, that is a slightly different thing, though. But I think that you could test it through that way. You could show an image. No, maybe you couldn't. Because you you can only demonstrate that the macaque is able to show the pattern. This looks yeah. like this. You wouldn't be able to conclusively prove that it could see that's me. Yeah. So, the, but there is a there is a test. Go on. What's the test? I think first of all, we can both agree that this is like quite a good, a big cognitive leap. Yeah, the ability for self self recognition. And I'll tell you at the animals that have passed the test. Can I guess some? Um, okay. Well, yeah. I reckon all the apes can do it. I think gorillas can do it. I think chimpanzees can do it and orangutans. Well, you see, not everything's had the test done to it. So I I can't, maybe it will be best if I just read the, the list. Dolphins. (laughs) Yes. Dolphins are one on the list. Cool. All right. Well, all right. That's fine. Just go on there. Dolphins, chimpanzees, as you've already said. Mm -hmm. Um, elephants. Yeah. Of course, humans, mm. we can do it. We, we acquire the scale at around 18 months. And also magpies. I knew it was going to be a bird. I was yeah. going to say crow, but magpie, yeah. They're very clever. They're corvids yeah. as well, I think. Yeah, they are corvids. Yeah. So the test basically is they are marked in a place that they wouldn't be able to see if they didn't have um, the use of a mirror. Okay. 
And then if they react to the mark, like touch it or, you know, try and scratch it off or whatever. Right. Then it's it's counted as a pass because they obviously have noticed that that's them in the mirror and noticed that there's something different about them. So they were acclimatized to the mirrors first. But, but even then, the test like surely is a little bit biased, right? Um, towards animals that can remove the mark easily. Uh, or that can indicate the mark. So like humans or chimpanzees were probably just like pointing at it or like touching it because it could be some a dye injected into the skin or something. Yeah, it's kind of hard for a, a magpie to do that. It's kind of hard for a magpie to do it. It's, it's nigh on impossible for like a frog to do it or a like a reptile to do it with little arms that can't articulate its body as much maybe. Yeah. Like a, a, if you put the mark on a gecko's back, it's not going to be able to show you where it is, is it? No, I've got that. Well, what if I told you that a fish has just passed the test? A fish? A fish. I reckon it's going to be a big old fish. Um, You'd be wrong. Oh. So the caveat of this is that it hasn't been peer-reviewed yet, but it's on BioArchive and everyone seems to think it's brilliant, so... Okay. Okay, okay, so okay. When they started the research, they tried doing it with cichlids. Yeah. So you're familiar with cichlids. There's lots of interesting research on them. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. They're a model organism, aren't they? Yeah. So we know that they're like very territorial, for example, when they build bowers. And so they have, um, they can, and that they can discriminate individual group members visually mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. by okay. using the color patterns around the face. Right. So they seemed like a good candidate to see if they could to, could do it, yeah? Mm-hmm. Um, but it turned out they couldn't pass the mirror test because they learn to recognize individuals in, in, a, in like true face recognition, like, like primates do, rather than uh, noticing, being able to learn themselves. Oh. Okay. What do you mean by that? Sorry, I'm... I'm... Seeing something that looks like you in a mirror and knowing it's you are very different things. So they would just recognize it as as an individual that looked like them because they didn't know it was them. Yeah, okay. So instead of being able to recognize themselves, they can recognize others. It makes sense that animals can do that without knowing that that's what they look like. Yeah. Or be able to distinguish themselves from a group Mm -hmm. of similar organisms. Okay, fine. So the fish that eventually passed it, I say eventually, I do think it was the second one they tried, was a tiny little fish about the size of the human finger. Yeah. Um, Latin, Labroides dimidiatus. <laughs> okay. I, uh, that sounds, uh, sounds like something I should know. Yeah, I think you will know. It's, it's better known as the blue diesel ras or the cleaner ras. The cleaner ras. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I do know the cleaner ras. Yeah, so these are those cool little fish that nibble away on dead skin and parasites and mucus on bigger fish, yeah? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so they were presented with a mirror. And at first, these fish were like, <laughs> get out of my territory, mm. um, were very aggressive towards the reflection in the mirror. Then they started doing something that was like really weird that, the, none of the fish biologists had like seen a cleaner ras do before. They started doing things like swimming towards the mirror really fast and then stopping suddenly before they just before they banged into it. Okay. They started swimming at the mirror upside down and at weird angles and things. And and the scientists saw this as them trying to contingency test that the reflection was themselves. Right. So then they tried the the. Um, the mirror test by injecting a spot of brown dye into the throat of the cleaner wrasse. So obviously it wouldn't have been able to see it because its eyes are like, well, not very far, but in the wrong place to see it. And when the, when the mirror was present, the cleaner wrasse started trying to rub the brown patch off its throat. But when there was no mirror there, the cleaner wrasse just carried on swimming as it would normally because there was nothing to inform it that it had the brown patch. Right. So, therefore, it had seen itself in the mirror and thought, mm, what, what's this going on? And removed the, the patch on its throat. Yeah. Okay, passed the test. We, I think we 
discredit fish Mm -hmm. or fishes and their abilities. People often say that goldfish have like two second memories, right? Yeah. Which is completely untrue. And now this is evidence that some species can recognize themselves. Yeah. Which is, you know, important philosophically. Perhaps we'll have a, a cleaner ras Socrates. Yeah. Well, this is the cleaner ras Socrates, obviously. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's weird because it's hard to say exactly what it means. Yeah. It's an important cognitive ability and yeah. an impressive cognitive ability. Or, well, having said that, is it? If something like a cleaner ras is, ca- is capable of it, is it really that impressive? So, I mean, it could have evolved specifically in the cleaner ras because of something to do with its ecology and the way that maybe it learns to discriminate the individual fish that it serves. Yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to think. I think it's really impressive for any sort of animal to do it because, mm-hmm. and especially something underwater, maybe this is a stupid comment, but I feel like you wouldn't see your reflection very often if you were underwater. Oh, well, I would say almost never. <laughs> So how has it learnt to recognise its reflection? Surely, like, animals only ever see their reflection in human human mirrors <laughs> and also in the surface of water and puddles and stuff like that. Yeah, well, I can think of a couple of other places, but... Where? Metal. Yeah, but what metal? Like, metals are human constructions, right? Natural metals don't really Mm, reflect. Um, There will be things. I don't think there are many reflective things in the natural world other than water. Okay, yeah, maybe. Unless I'm Mm. just thinking, like, missing something completely obvious. Yeah, I know, but um, that's what I'm worried about, but I can't think of another one, so... Yeah. (laughs) I guess you must be right. Yeah. Hmm. So I think they learn to do it very quickly. Like, it doesn't understand it's itself when you first put the mirror in. So it's not something that's learned over an evolutionary timescale, but it's something it has the ability to learn because of its cognitive abil- its general cognitive abilities from its job. That just bewilders me. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? How has a fish learned how to do that when that thing never happens in its... It must happen. It must occasionally see its own reflection. I just don't believe it would have even the capability to learn if it didn't ever see its reflection. Maybe in the mucus of another fish. And maybe that's the reason that they are the ones that have evolved it, because they see the mucus up close, because they suck it off. There you go. Another hypothesis for them. And because because they swim alongside it. They swim alongside it like pilot fish, yeah? They stick close to other fish as well as, I guess, for protection, for food and protection. Maybe it is the reflection that they see in the other fish. Well, that's just a hypothesis, but... Yeah, but scales are very reflective. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what how much light gets through like under the water. Oh, lots of light. Just not so much red light. Mm. Lots of blue light. Of course. Okay. Well, there you go. Did you like that? Yeah, I do like that. I think that's really interesting. I think it's cool mm. that uh, there is a fish, a species of fish, that is able to do something that, you know, humans have held in high regard for so many years that yeah. we only really ever attribute to life forms that we would consider to be incredibly well developed um in terms of intelligence oh yeah i mean when you look at that list humans chimpanzees elephants dolphins magpies blue diesel wrasse a trait that i prize quite highly in myself physically is light-footedness yeah not making noise yeah being a quiet walker yeah would you, you know, you've lived with me. Do you think I sneak around, ninja around? Um, I, I, it's not something I ever noticed. But also, oh. you know, that's, I never noticed you as a heavy footer either. Do you, do you think you're quite light footed? Mm, I think I'm probably about average. My brother is incredibly light footed. Sometimes when I go back home, I'll just be in a room and then he'll start talking to me and I had no idea he was there. And he's like right next to me. I do that to people all of the time. Well, obviously I'm usually 
shouting something as I approach, but <laughs> it has happened to me. I didn't know you were light footed. Yeah, I, I mean, well, I thought I think I'm a quiet walker. But mm. now now that we we're talking about it and this research that I'm I'm reading about, it it suggests that maybe we don't have the capacity ourselves to even register the sound of our own footsteps. Really? Okay, so essentially the scientists what the scientists did in research this created a virtual reality for some mice. Mm-hmm. So the implanted some electrodes into the brain into the auditory cortex where sounds are processed and then the put a, a mouse on a tiny little treadmill <laughs> and every time the foot pad makes contact with the treadmill it makes a, a note a tone like a beep 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 beep, beep would be it running fast and beep beep would be it chilling out you know nice yeah and what happened was over a couple of days the activity in the auditory cortex decreased so it was no longer responding to the stimulus of the note that was playing at the same time it was walking. Okay. And then if they changed the note, the auditory cortex, like, flashed back up again, was having really high activity. Okay, yeah. What, what this suggests is that the mouse is learning to recognise that the motor cortex of the brain and the auditory cortex of the brain are producing some sort of a filter, like an acoustic filter, mm -hmm. that's filtering out everything that your own body is making. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Essentially, like, changing the note that plays is like wearing a pair of particularly clippy shoes one day and thinking, oh, God. Like, you can hear the sound of your own footsteps really loudly. Right, okay, yes, I see. So when you, yeah, when you get some, some old cloppers and you yeah. pop them on... And then you notice the sound of your footsteps. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's nice, isn't it? When you're on like nice floor uh, well, yeah. and you're clopping along. I love that. Yeah. But so you, you might not be able to, you know, if you're just walking around the house in your normal slippers, we might not notice the sound of our own foot. You know, you were describing people as heavy footed. Mm. I think we should now check that we ourselves are not heavy footed mm. and haven't just filtered out the sound. Mm-hmm. So this was in mice, obviously, but I can I can see it happening in humans. Yeah, I can see it too. I can see the benefit as well. Of, oh yeah, the evolutionary advantage. Yeah, there's yeah. no point dedicating energy to listening to that. Because you know what that is. Yeah, exactly. There's no need to be alert for the sound of your own footsteps because you know you're making them. Exactly, yeah. I wonder if the same sort of thing happens with our heartbeat. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but at a mouse, it's going to be even more, even louder because of, like, the scale on which we're talking. Like, a mouse's heart is very close to its ear. A mouse's ear is very sensitive. It can hear its own heartbeat. Mm. It must learn to filter it out because if a predator's nearby and you can't hear it because you can only hear yourself running or you can only hear your own heartbeat, you're going to get captured a lot easier, yeah? Yeah, definitely. You you need to cancel those frequencies so that you can have a, a clearer signal to things that might actually benefit your survival. Exactly. Yeah. And they actually tested that particular idea a little bit more explicitly in the paper. So what they did was um, put mice that were trained on the treadmill and then played a, another acoustic cue out of, the, out of the blue. I don't know what it was, maybe a bird or something. Yeah. And the ones that were trained to ignore the tones that were being played as they were running could detect the signal much better than the ones that were having it novelly for the first time. They said that they weren't yet used to it. Yeah, so they weren't cancelling out the frequency. Yeah. That's brilliant. Wow. Yeah. What a way to prove that little hypothesis. Mm. That's amazing. Are they testing it in other organisms? I, not that I know of, not that, I'm, not that I've seen, but... If this had been my idea, that would be my next step, yeah. I'd go straight to humans. That's what people want to know, right? But it's a lot harder for humans because we wear shoes. Yeah, but you can just do the same thing, the same beeps. No, but our shoes have different frequencies, yeah. So it's after a couple of days that the mouse gets used to the sounds. Fine, but just get a load of people in some facility and do the same thing with the beep on the treadmill and then just measure the um, cerebral whatever it was. Yeah, oh, the auditory cortex. Yeah. If, it, if yeah. it responds in the same way that the mouse does, then I think that you can say by extension, the same thing's happening in humans, or it looks like yeah. it is. 
Yeah. Good idea. You've only got to uh, measure the the brain waves, right? Mm. And you haven't even got to make a <laughs> tiny little mouse-sized treadmill. You've only got to measure the brain waves. I say that as if I think that's a really easy thing to do. I think they do know how to do it. Some people do. Yeah, it must be easy. I don't know. That's that's. I, I mean, that is really interesting. The people who live in the flat above um, me, yeah, they are very loud sometimes, stomping around. I think they're children, and they just stomp around from one end of the flat all the way to the other. So there's no getting away from them. You can't go to a different <laughs> room. It's like they're running from like one end to the other end, doing the the beep test. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, they just don't know any better. They they might, yeah, they have no idea they're making that much noise. Maybe you could print off a copy of the article and slip it under the door. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I will do that. Well, uh, yeah, please do. I'll let you know how that goes. But I doubt they'll realise it's you. I think they'd think it was a really weird thing to happen. Someone put a scientific journal article under the door about mice running on treadmills. I'm still going to do it. I think it'd be really funny. I'll do it and then I'll I'll record my a video of me doing it and then I'll put it on Twitter. Okay. Do you want to know what the title of the paper is? Yes. It, it was a nature paper, so, you know, you know they know their stuff. Oh, yeah. A cortical filter that learns to suppress the acoustic consequences of movement. That is a bit passive-aggressive. If I received that under my door, I would think... That's somebody being passive aggressive about how much noise I'm making. That's absolutely true, actually. That is a really academic, scientific way to say, shut up. A cortical filter that learns to suppress the acoustic consequences of movement. (laughs) But I guess it could also be used in the reverse to if you gave a complaint about noise, they could shove that under the door and say, well, a mouse can get used to it in two days, so... When I was on holiday in Greece, I read AIQ, which is a book that you recommended all about artificial intelligence, yes. how it works, what we're going to do with it, and also what we are doing with it. I thought it was a really good book. Lovely dust sleeve. Mm, it's okay. okay. The yellow one. Yeah, and I like the sort of sheen on the on the letters. Mm. I, I tend to take the sleeve off whilst I'm reading... Oh, yeah, I do when I'm reading it, but, oh, no, yeah, that stays on the bookshelf when it's being read. Mm, mm. I, li- I like that as well because I think the book, the naked book, looks great. Yeah, and I'm also, I'm not bothered about other people knowing what I'm reading. No. Yeah, whereas when it's on the shelf... <laughs> oh, yeah. Then, then it's showing off. Yeah. <laughs> if it makes it to the shelf. Oh, do you, you go through a selective process with your book? If books? I don't like it, then I just take it to the charity shop. Do you? If I don't want to keep it. Yeah, okay. Like once every couple of months, not every book. That's a good idea. I might start doing that. Hmm. Anyway, I thought it was a really good book. It was. It gave me a really good understanding of how AI works. Yeah. And, you know, all, all the sorts of different applications that there were for it. Some of the things that were most interesting about it, things like... How Netflix has managed to go up against the multi-million movie industry, like Hollywood, essentially, yeah, and create content that it knows people will want to watch based on the data that they have from people's viewing habits. Yeah. Netflix has built up such a good picture of what people like to watch that they can create better content than perhaps anybody else. Mm-hmm. I thought that was amazing. And also it just showcases the bigger your database, the better quality your data. Like there is an unbelievable amount of value in that. If you can unlock that in the right way. Someone might take issue with the um, idea that Netflix's products are better per se. Oh, yeah. Because what, what they produce is what they know that people want. As opposed to something with artistic credibility. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Although, having said that, I think they have produced some stuff that's done really, really well. Like Orange is the New Black, for example. Yeah. House of Cards. Those shows have been critically acclaimed. You know, I've seen both of those, not the whole way through, maybe two seasons 
I think maybe the first two seasons for each of them. And I thought they were both really good. Yeah. I didn't really stick with them because I guess they keep producing it until their metrics suggest that people are no longer watching, right? Yeah, but people are still always watching. They, they put it until, like, the new seasons tail off. Like, the people have obviously run out of ideas. People aren't liking the new ones as much as they like the old ones. And then you can still keep all of the library playing all of the time. So it's mm. still there for people who have never seen Orange is the New Black to watch, even if it gets cancelled. Yeah, that's true. That's another of the, the benefits. Like, if Emmerdale got polled... Oh, well, you know, we've got 40, 50 years of Emmerdale, ITV have, but... That is bonkers. No one can, no one can get access to it because it's only on at 7 o'clock four times a week, five times a week. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's so weird, isn't it? Yeah. The soap operas just have the shortest little lifespans, longevities. They're just gone mm-hmm. as soon as they air. Yeah. Until the omnibus on a Sunday. I don't even... Well, it's on ITV too. Do they not do... Oh, wow, okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the thing is, they can eventually... They can... Because they've got such good data on what people want, the way that TV production companies usually try and get a show commissioned by whoever, the person who's going to show it, Mm -hmm. the the channels, is by making a backdoor pilot, which costs a lot of money. Yeah. And that money essentially being wasted because you're just showing that to the broadcasters which might give you a bit of money to make the show yeah people people who who are employed to decide whether it's going to do well yeah they're not putting it in an actual test environment with where subjects are able to decide oh i want to watch this or not you have to go on the judgment of an individual or several individuals a tiny pool of -hmm. talent i think even more impressive is the way that they talk about the reason Amazon can deliver your thing the next day is because they already predicted that you somebody would be wanting the thing the next day. So it was already in the warehouse in Leeds ready to come. Yeah, it's always it's already on the way to you yeah. before you've even selected the product. Yeah. One of the most interesting things about this um, is it's convinced me that with Netflix and with Amazon, I currently use, Bella and I use the same Netflix account and yeah. we use the same profile. So the, the recommendations that we get are a mix of both of our likes mm-hmm. yeah, for Netflix. And also I do the same with Amazon. I'm always ordering things because I've got Prime. So people are always asking me to order them things and then they'll just pay me the money yeah. so that they can get it the next day. And I, I, I don't have any problems with that. But that means that the things that I'm being suggested aren't based on just my profile. Yeah, yeah. And it's really important it's really important that we just use the same profiles because I will get better suggestions. Particularly with Netflix, I want to be recommended things that they know I'm going to like yeah. based on their AI. Well, the which... thing with Netflix is maybe that you, you should have one account for you, one account for Bella, one account for you and Bella so that when you're just sitting in the lounge and you're looking for something to watch, oh, these are recommendations for Harvey and Bella. That's genius. Hmm. That's what they should do. You should just be able to, at the moment, you just choose account, but you should just be able to check an unlimited number of people or everyone gets the phone out and logs in Yeah. into one TV app. But at the moment, it's only in one account, right? At the moment, you, you have an account and then it has profiles, mm-hmm. but we all just use, I just use Bella's profile because it's the first one to click on. Yeah. Because I didn't really recognise how valuable it would be yeah. to have recommendations tailored to my particular profile. Yeah. Can you imagine the rubbish that I get recommended? I imagine it's mainly musicals. Yeah, well, yes. Spotify once recommended me the greatest hits of The Cause. <laughs> Fly away. Is that The Cause? Oh. Run away. Is that The Cause? Yeah, um... What could I do to make you love me? Mm. What could I do? Mm. <laughs> anyway, we digress slightly. I did want to talk about AIQ. Yeah. Because it was such a good book. But it's directly related to the topic that I want to talk about this week, which is AI mm-hmm. and a cool study based on AI. So I'm fairly familiar with AI. And I was before I read the book, you know, through my job doing media relations for tech startups and growing companies. I've had the opportunity to work with quite a few AI companies. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and it's obvious that the scope for application is huge. I can't think of many industries that aren't implementing AI currently. Hairdressing. Yeah, you say hairdressing and uh, the generic drift hairdressing app. It's coming. <laughs> Trimder. <laughs> it's rubbish. It's not rubbish. The people who use the app, teenage girls, will think it's great. Trimder. It's a, the best pun. Everyone was rolling around laughing at work. Trimder. No, I just like trim. Well, you could do blow and go for the mobile version. That's too rude. Or hair today. Hair today, gone tomorrow. Well, that's implied. Anyway, yeah. we're not talking about this. We've we finished this a long time ago. We did, yeah. Okay, right. No, 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 no. Okay. So, something that's always been a bit of a concern for people is that AI is eventually going to supersede humans. Yes. We will develop what we call super intelligence, which surpasses the capabilities of the brightest and most gifted human minds. Mm -hmm. And this is a fear, right? Yeah. AIQ sort of downplays these fears, but I think they're still there. And lots of people, there's a school of thought where people are still concerned about it. It really boils down to how can we control something that is always one step ahead of us because it's more intelligent. Yeah? Mm. No? Mm, is it, though? It's just better at spotting patterns. At the moment, in its current form, yes. But once we develop something that... Once we develop super intelligence... Yeah. Yeah. Then, then there's this worry. Mm -hmm. We're not worried about the current AI that we have. We're worried about the AI of tomorrow. I mean, people are. Are they? They're worried about the current AI? Yeah. Who's worried about current AI? You know, just the uninformed people. They're not worried about what it's currently doing. Are they, they are. People are worried about an Alexa. Everyone's worried, oh, no, the, the Alexa's listening to me. Oh, no, the Xbox is listening to me when... They're not worried about the robot listening. They're worried that, they're, that the robot's sending that to a human. Mm. They're not, they don't think that Alexa's going to, you know, get a kitchen knife and stab them. No. They think that They think that it's being used for nefarious purposes. Yeah. Which may be true. Certainly true of, you know, Facebook and Google. Mm. So, mm. anyway, this topic of super intelligence has been covered in lots of movies. My favourite probably being Ex Machina. Have you seen that? No. It's tremendous. One of my favourite ever movies made, directed by Alex Garland, who did Annihilation, which we reviewed in episode six. Yes, I do remember that one. Yeah. It's better than Annihilation. It's brilliant. You need to watch it, all right? Okay. Promise me you'll watch it. Maybe. We can do it as a review, maybe. It's a bit late. It is a bit late. It's quite... <laughs> it's a few years old now. Um, if you haven't seen it, I don't want to give anything away, but it is an absolute must-see for anyone who's even got the slightest interest in AI. And there are lots of other movies as well. Can you think of any cover that topic? <sighs> I, Robot, is that, is that one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good um, one. Will Smith. Humans, not a movie, but a... A TV show. TV show. Yeah, that's right. There's some um, older ones, The Matrix, Terminator, obvious sort of ones, and then even 2001 Space Odyssey. Have you seen that? No. Ooh. Ooh. Um, yeah. yeah, a lot of sci-fi. Yeah, there's something scary about robots and machines. And in fact, in the most recent series of Black Mirror, there was an episode... I thought it was a pretty good one. Uh, the one that was all in black and white. That was the worst one. Oh, it was good. And it had these robotic dogs that had taken over Britain, or maybe even the world. You didn't like that one? No. Okay, fine. But you've seen it. I'm glad you've seen it. The dogs in that episode were based on real-life robots from Boston Dynamics. Did you know this? No, no. They're these quadruped robots, and there's quite a few different models... Um, I believe they started with a model called Big Dog, which was designed to be this robotic pack mule, and it support soldiers and carry their supplies over terrain that was too unsteady for traditional vehicles. Yeah. And then most recently, they developed a model called the Spot Mini, which is a lightweight robot, more lightweight, and makes less noise and appears to have much more sophisticated AI and autonomy. So I'm going to show you a video, mm -hmm. which I'll include in the show notes, it came out earlier this year showcasing some of the spot minis capabilities tell me what you're seeing um 
I'm seeing an advert for currentaccountswitch.co.uk. <laughs> it's a man flying an aeroplane and it's gone into an app. Oh, here we go, skip ad. So I've got a lab floor, a robot walking across it. It's very good. It's like a dog. It's like um, it's like one of those window vac. It's like a Karcher window vac with legs. Mm. Oh, another one's come in. This one's got an arm. This is terrifying. <laughs> this is terrifying. This is terrifying. <laughs> What's happened then? He's opened the door with his arm, pushed it open, and the other one is walking through. It's, mm. oh my God, it's too dog-like. It is very dog-like, isn't it? No, I'm frightened of it. Yeah? I'm frightened of a lot of living things. Like, if I see a spider running across the floor, I don't think, oh my God, that's cool. I think, oh my God, there's a spider on the floor. <laughs> and I get the same sort of feeling with that. Like, it makes me uneasy, the fact that it can do that. So there's a... A dog-like robot comes over to a door. It can't get through the door. One of its mates turns up and it has an arm. It opens the door for the other one and then they both go through together. Yeah. So when the video was released, a lot of people were, like you, quite scared. Mm -hmm. It looks like sci-fi. It looks a bit like the Black Mirror episode. It looks like the other dog is realising that the door is open, the, do the dog without the arm. And then mm -hmm. knowing, well, now I can go through there. Now I can complete my mission. Mm -hmm. That's almost as worrying to me as the fact that the dog can open the door, like that it's got this latent period where it evaluates the task and just like decides I'm a trot around doing nothing and then can instantly spot the doors open and is back out of it. It's crazy. Yeah. So it's it seems a bit scary mm. that there's this robot that appears to be making decisions and applying like the correct mechanics in order to execute tasks like opening and going through doors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's worth mentioning that Boston Dynamics, the developers of these robots, uh, it's a private company. So a lot of their research is very closely guarded mm -hmm. and outsiders like us aren't 100% certain on how the robots are functioning. Um, Wired did an article shortly after this video was released and they explained that people can often get a bit carried away because these robots appear to show a lot more autonomy than it is likely that they genuinely have. Okay. It could be that they're simply just programmed to do that task. Yeah, or something like Robot Wars. Exactly, exactly. They had arms on Robot Wars, actually, yeah. <laughs> but they couldn't open doors. It's still impressive. No, no, that's right. It is it's certainly impressive, that's for for sure. But it makes people scared of these robots. And that mm -hmm. begs a question, why? Why are people scared of robots? Some people think that this is because humans tend to anthropomorphize everything. Yeah? Animals, robots, inanimate objects, we personify them all. Absolutely. I do it on this show all of the time, accidentally. I'll be talking about an animal and yeah, imbue human characteristics upon it. I've probably done it in this episode. <laughs> yeah, we talked about uh, my robotic vacuum cleaner a few episodes ago. Yeah. He's, he's called Mr. Beauregard. And yeah. often when I talk to my mum on the phone, she'll ask me, how's Mr. Beauregard? Has he eaten any of your pants lately? Mm. You know? I don't know why we do this, but we really do humanise everything. So I'm going to show you a second video from Boston Dynamics again. Uh, now, this one is for its Atlas model, which is a bipedal robot that resembles a human. Mm. And this video got, I'm not going to sort of ruin anything, but this video got a bit of a different response. So I will send you the link. And if you could, again, sort of describe what you're, what you're seeing. I think it's because we had to humanise ourselves. We had to anthropomorphise ourselves. I think it's an evolutionary imper imperative that we have to imbue the characteristics of society upon things that mm. exist okay or the, but yeah never mind <laughs> i'm watching now here we go go to one minute don't need to watch the first minute okay so it's a robot picking up a 10 pound box allegedly and putting it on a shelf <laughs> allegedly yeah the rope it's picking up another one it's bending down doing the lift nice straight back <laughs> um but it doesn't look that stable, and I could do it faster. Mm. 
So I'm less worried about this. This seems less intelligent to me. But wait. A man has just come up with a broom, um, physically assaulted the robot, which has dropped the box, and now he's he seems to be taunting it. Mm. Um, but the, the robot continues to try and do its job. I find this kind of upsetting for the robot. Yeah. I'm like, oh... You're not on your own. A lot of people found this upsetting. You just want... Yeah, you just want to let him pick up the box, right? The man's not letting him pick up the box. Yeah. And the man's actually, you could say, attacking the robot with this hockey stick, right? Oh, yeah, well, he's just pushed him right over. Yeah, and that's sad, yeah? Yeah. Oh, I think it's broke. Oh, no, it's not. Oh, oh, wow. No, this is scary again. <laughs> well, so he pushed the robot over and the robot's got back up, yeah? Yeah, but the way it got up was a bit, you know, threatening. And now it's yeah. going out the fire escape. It's escaping. <laughs> it's just operated at... You can't use a fire escape. <laughs> okay. Okay. So... That was a thrill ride. You're right. Okay. It is slightly upsetting to watch you're watching a man assault a robot mm -hmm. and i'm glad that you had that response lots of people had that response as well and particularly when it falls over it's like you know that's don't do that that poor little robot <laughs> yeah but i think if it was one of the dog shaped ones i wouldn't have felt as bad really yeah so i, d I think it's more understandable that the human shaped one that acts like a human and walks like a human mm -hmm. i feel more upset about than the one that doesn't really look like a dog, just looks like something with four legs. It's got a, it's got an arm on its back. I don't have a video of this, but there is, I think, the original dog, the big dog. There is a video of somebody pushing that, and it sort of struggles to right itself, but it, it doesn't fall over. And it's an impressive, you know, showcase of its capabilities of staying upright. Mm hmm but I found that upsetting as well. Yeah, and maybe. I, I, I haven't seen it, so... Mm, so sorry, I, I, I can't find it now. But I might include it in the show notes. But the, the, the bipedal one is far more human than the dog one is. But people feel sorry for the dogs. And people, as I say, like people humanise them and anthropomorphise them. That's why we feel sorry for dogs, I would say. People felt like it's cruel to hit this robot with a stick, right? And knock yeah. items out of its hands because yeah. we've humanised that robot. Yeah. So this brings me on to a study that was recently published in PLOS One, meaning it's open access, which is very useful for people like me outside of academia. Mm -hmm. um, the researchers have tested a scenario which they describe as begging computer does not want to die. OK, yeah, I think I've heard this. Yeah. In the experiment, 89 people were asked to complete some tasks with the help of a small humanoid robot called Now or Neo. I'm going to call him Now. Uh, the test subjects were told that the robot was like a little assistant bot and that the tasks they were completing were in order to help improve um, Now's algorithms. Are you sure it's not Neo like the Matrix? No, it's N-A-O. Okay. N Nao. Na now. I'm going to say Now. I like Now. Or Neo. Should I say Neo? Um, well, you should say however it's actually pronounced. I don't know how it's pronounced. I'm going to say Now. Okay. Now. <laughs> so, for example... It, um, the people have been asked to use now. All right, I'm going to call him Neo. People have been asked to use Neo to organize, help organize their weekly schedule, that sort of stuff. So okay. basic stuff like that, assistant tasks. Once the tasks were completed, the subjects were then asked to turn the robot off, at which point for half of the humans, Neo would start pleading not to turn him off, saying things like, no, please don't, or I'm afraid of the dark, mm -hmm. stuff like that. 30 of the 43 volunteers who heard the protests took on average twice as long to turn the robot off when compared to individuals who didn't hear the begging. Mm -hmm. The remaining 13 of those 43 completely refused to turn him off. Okay. So the researchers say that this is evidence to show that humans can be emotionally manipulated by robots. Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen with AI becoming more and more a part of our lives, it's also getting like more personal, yeah? So AI like Alexa is in our homes. Many of us use it every day. Same with the ones that are on our phones. Yeah. 
Will we become more emotionally invested in our technology? Yeah, and will they, will they give back more? Yeah, exactly. They'll become more like our friends, right? Yeah. Like they know us yeah. and we know them. Mm. Some people, though, think that it's just because it's still a novelty and we're simply going to get used to it like in the, in the decades to come so that eventually it will just be that people don't really care. You well, know, why about... won't it always inv- invent its own novelty if it's, um, if it's super intelligence? If it has the ability to do that. Because at the moment, this is just a person. It's a person manipulating the people doing the test, really, isn't it? Yes. It's a person deciding whether it plays a sound, which, you know, maybe it's a computer-generated voice, but it's still like human language, the sound, like... It's still a person manipulating a person through speech, which, Mm -hmm. you know, it's been around for a long time, that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. I, th- I think in a way this has repercussions for super intelligence, mm-hmm. but also in a way it also is, it, it, it can be applied to the way that the companies who are developing this technology might even be able to rely on that emotional manipulation to ensure that we engage more with their products. Yeah. That we don't want to turn those things off. Mm. We've um, just talked about it, it wasn't on the podcast, but before we started recording, I deleted my Facebook profile. And for a long time, I've been thinking I should do that. But I kind of was a bit manipulated by the fact that so many people are on there. It's a great, you know, so many of my photos are on there, my memories, all this sort of stuff. People that I, you know, haven't spoken to for years that I might want to reconnect with. And I kind of didn't like that I was so reliant and reluctant. Attached to to it. Yeah, exactly. So attached to it. Mm -hmm. To a certain extent, I think Facebook, that's how Facebook had managed to maintain this huge database of, of people. Yeah. But if if there was an AI that was also emotionally manipulating me into staying there because I felt sorry for it or something, you know, mm-hmm. like, you know, it, it was already really hard to remove. Imagine when we, when we move forward and we have this emotional connection to our technology and that technology is actually able to manipulate us. Yeah. It's scary. Yeah. Okay. Well, you've really put my mind at ease about AI now. Oh, well, I didn't want to put your mind at ease. I thought AIQ, for as great as it was, I think it was a really good book. I think it really downplayed all of these fears for AI. But emotional manipulation, it looks like it can happen. Yeah. I think the fact that you just opened it with those videos of the robot has... If you'd have questioned me out straight away, like, do, do you think that you would feel sorry for a robot in this situation, in this situation? Yeah, people would. Mm-hmm. And like I did. So I think, you know, I'm not saying that I'm a typical representative of humans, but a scientific test has also proved that people do so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the future's not as bright as we thought then. No. We still have reason to fear AI. That's what I think. You're a cheese fan, right? Yes, I love cheese. What's your what's your fave cheese? I don't think I can answer that question. Really? Yeah, because cheese is, you know, it changes. It depends on what time of day it is, what you've got to have it with. You know, I, I love um, Leerdammer. I think that's mm, yeah, superb yeah, in like a sandwich. Yeah. I, I like a bit of cheddar, a little block of ch- of cheddar. I like Jarlsberg. I like Stilton when I yeah. want something strong. Okay. I love camembert. Oh, yes. We love a camembert. Mm. We used to have camembert all the time. Uh, yeah, it baked with a, a French stick. Cheddar is the UK's most popular cheese. Yes. Um, 55% of cheese sold straight to customers is cheddar in the UK. 55%? Yeah. That's, wow. a, that's a lot, isn't it? It's got a huge market share. So this is just like when you get a pack of cheese, though. Not including cheese that's in, in things. Oh, okay. So, okay, yeah. So fine. it's probably even more cheddar, though, because, like, realistically. Mm, I bet mozzarella's quite high. Yeah, yeah. With, pe- with pizzas. Yeah, yeah, good yeah. point. We, in Britain, eat 700,000 tonnes of cheese per year, according wow. to the British Cheese Board. <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> That's brilliant. It's better than Tremda. I'm, yeah. well, I'm willing to admit that. Yeah, that is brilliant. And our European relatives, not relatives, neighbours, uh, not relatives <laughs> anymore. No. Eat, you know, some some countries eat double that amount. Like, you know. France. Yeah, exactly. People have cheese for breakfast and things, don't they? And yeah. On, on the continent all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So some archaeologists were digging around in the tomb of... All right, I'm going to have a go. Tamies. Tamies? P-T-A-H-M-E. Okay, yes. yeah. Let's go with Tamies, yeah. Tamies. Yeah, so this is in ancient Egypt. He was a high-ranking clerk, but like not a pharaoh or anything like that. But he had a okay. tomb anyway. So they were digging around his tomb. And they found a bit of white stuff in a jar. Mm. And thought, well, you know, as archaeologists do, we'll give this a bit of analysis. <laughs> And yeah. the subsequent um, protein analysis of, of the white stuff uh, showed that it was 3,200-year-old cheese. Okay. Yeah. Do they know it was cheese when it was buried? Could have just been milk, right? No, it was cheese. It was cheese when it was buried. So right. we know that they were eating cheese in ancient Egyptian times. Okay, yeah. I can believe that. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think it's cool. Can you but... believe it? I'm not surprised. Why not? Why? Well, because I think cheese has probably been... Cheese, is, cheese has just been around for almost as long as we've been domesticating cattle, I suspect. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we've been drinking their milk. Mm. People can't just drink milk. They've probably been playing around with it, seeing what they can do with it. Well, and they've worked out cheese. It's interesting you say that. Because two-thirds two of the world is lactose intolerant. That's true. Yeah. But there aren't aren't those areas of the world is that because they didn't domesticate cattle or goats or sheep? Well no, obviously they have a lot of places have their own versions of even if it won't be a cattle or a goat or a sheep, it would still be a domestic mammal. Mm, but maybe not one you could milk. All domestic female all female mammals. You need an udder, though. No. Yeah, you do. You select for something more oddery. No. They naturally have udders. Yeah, but... because so, Okay. Humans haven't created the udder through selective breeding. No, but a lot of things have got udders. A lot of things have got nipples. You can milk a cat. Things have got nipples. Things have got nipples. I don't think you can just milk something with nipples. I think you need an udder. I think you can milk things with nipples. I don't think you can. Okay. I just, I don't know why. I just think you need an udder. The only animals that we drink milk from have udders. Even though we domesticate other animals with, with uh, nipples. We drink like, pig's milk. No, we don't. People do? People do not drink People pig's do milk. People drink pig's milk. I cannot believe you're arguing this. Nobody <gasps> drinks pig milk. People, Okay. Do yaks have udders? Yes, because it's like a cow. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Bosgronians, yeah, you are right. Like, and a goat and a sheep, they both have udders, right? A goat does, I th I, and a sheep's pretty much a goat, right? The only other animal that I can think of that has an udder is a, is deer. I don't know why we don't drink deer milk. But sorry, go on. <laughs> anyway, so when we're born, we have enzymes that can break down lactose yeah lactase because we all start drinking breast milk or you know whatever our mother produces but when we get older most people in the world that is two-thirds of the people in the world lose the lactase that can break down lactose in milk and and so they become lactose intolerant and it can have you know adverse consequences if you then drink milk mm -hmm. not not very nice bloating messier side issues yes so the gene that makes lactase has been dated like the appearance of it has been dated back in studies of ancient human skeletons to be about four to four thousand five hundred years ago okay but we know we've been using milk for a lot longer than that so we have evidence of as keeping and storing milk in the neolithic period like so that's between six thousand and um, 2,500 
years before Christ. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense because, you know, when when the um, struggle for survival is so severe, you're happy to put up with a bit of bloating if it means you get access to some food stuff like milk, right? Well, re- it, is it though? Because I think there's this thought that um, some guy just saw a cow, uh, a baby calf, drinking milk from its mother and thought, oh, I'm going to have a bit of that. And and drank some milk. Yeah. But people wouldn't do that very often if they weren't enjoying it, right? There would be no selection pressure for lactose tolerance if the case was that it made 99.9999% of people sick. Um, I think there would, because... Because people would just stop drinking it. But food wasn't abundant. We needed We needed to find food and nutrition absolutely anywhere we could and when you're rearing cattle for uh, eventual slaughter domesticating species you're going to also make use of the the other resources that they they give out which would be but a cow a cow only produces milk when it's got a calf so it would be you trading off feeding the calf for having the milk you'd be sharing the milk or you'd be getting your cow pregnant, killing the calf, eating the calf, and drinking the milk, and then getting the cow pregnant again. You would constantly want to be maintaining some sort of pregnancy. Yeah, maybe. I'm sure you would. I'm sure you would, because that's what you want. You want more and more and more, right? This is the theory, anyway. Hmm. So, cheese has a lot less lactose in it than milk. Oh, okay. Because when you ferment milk you turn lactose into lactic acid. And when you... So when you make cheese, you separate the curds and the whey, right? Mm. Yeah, you save the curds and make cheese out of them and discard the whey. And most of the um, lactose sugars are in the whey. That's Mm -hmm. (laughs) W-H-E-Y. So if humans, uh, all at first we know, were lactose intolerant, basically, as adults... Mm-hmm. And we're keeping these domestic animals and figured out a way to produce a less toxic, for want of a better word, version of milk by manipulating the milk, turning it into cheese, reducing the lactose content. Then that could have led to the pressure itself, the the selection pressure for the lactase gene that that can break down just raw milk, normal milk. Lactase persistence, yeah. Lactase persistence. Persistence yeah. into adulthood. Yeah. Yes. I think that makes sense. I think still m- the milk would be beneficial, but if you could use the milk to make... Not if it make... harms you. But it, it, it's, it's a niggle. Beneficial, yeah. I'm sure that people still get nutrients if they can't digest the lactose, but it's just it's not comfortable, is it? it no, it, it bloats you, yeah, all sorts of digestive problems. So you actually lose you lose a lot of water and you lose, mm. you know, st- stomach contents with the side effects of consuming lactose. Is it that severe for people? Well, if you drink or a is lot it of milk, just a bit of discomfort? I'm not the person to ask. I love cheese. But maybe that's maybe that's it. Maybe cheese isn't as bad. <laughs> that does make sense though. I, I see what you're saying. So the milk made people feel unwell. So they made it into cheese instead, which made them feel less unwell. And mm-hmm. that provided a bit of a, a stepping stone for humans to evolve lactase persistence, yeah. which is the reason that we now can not just digest cheese uh, carefree, but also milk, where yeah. there's a higher concentration of lactose. Yeah, that does make sense. I can, I can imagine it happening like that. Mm hmm. Because to me, now I've now I've read about it this way, it just doesn't make any sense that it happened the other way to me. Really? It just doesn't make sense that if lactose intolerance was the same back then as it is now, which I don't know if it is because I don't know what lactose intolerance is in, say, Asia. Mm-hmm. I don't it's, know whether... It's, it's huge. It's enormous. Yeah, it's, but it's a, nearly all of the population, right? Yeah. But... Is their reaction the same to somebody who's lactose intolerant in the UK drinking milk? Yeah, I think so. It's just they don't... It's exactly the same mechanism, right? They don't have 
lactase. They don't produce lactase, so they can't break down the lactose. And they don't drink milk? Yeah. In the, even in the rural areas? Yeah, I think so. So then why would, it, why, would, why would we have just kept drinking milk if it was that bad? Um, and because they didn't. Because, because now they have, they have access to different food items that they're able to exploit. No. Communist yeah. China didn't. Mm. That should have produced a population bottleneck from just people saying, oh, well, we're wasting all this milk. I don't know if they they have that many cows, though. I don't know whether they... I feel like what would have, what happened is that for the ancestors of Europeans and also certain cultures in Africa, there was some sort of cattle ancestor that we were able to domesticate, and that cattle gave us meat, but it also produced milk, which we obviously drank from our parents when we were babies. And then because... I'm assuming back when we were started to domesticate these animals, you couldn't just go to Tesco and buy whatever you wanted or, you know, have access to widespread um, plant life or agriculture or whatever. We had to take whatever resources were available to us. And I suspect that a lot of milk was being produced. And even though it made people feel uncomfortable and it made people lose some fluids, the net effect of drinking milk was it gave you nutrition. And then that put a selective pressure on people who were able to produce lactase. They were able to, you know, survive much better. But it's got an, it's got a single uh, the origin of a single person. Does it really? Yeah. A single person. Yeah, I think so. A single mutation. Yeah. Wow. But I think there are different types of lactase persistence genes. But the one for all of Europe, yeah. Wow, that is really interesting. I didn't think that. Mm. I thought that it would have emerged independently all over the place. No. Wow, okay. All right, well, that throws my theory a little bit out the window then, doesn't Mm. it? I I don't think it throws it completely out of the window, but it was just very fortunate that her village hadn't given up on milk. Mm. Mm. And I also don't know how well they can trace back these things, you know, 8,000 years ago. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure there's some uncertainty around how many people it came from. I bet it was horrible, the first cheese. Yeah, this Egyptian cheese. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, 3,000 years isn't... I mean, it is aged, but maybe (laughs) a little bit too much. (laughs) 3,000 years? Yeah. It'd be fine if it was like Parmesan. Yeah. That stuff lasts forever. I got some Parmesan in the fridge. It's been in there for months. Mm, it's delicious. Fine. It's fine. Parmesan, it's so hard. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. Thank the um thank that one woman. Thank you, that one woman. Who um who mutated and has let us all drink the breast fluid of creatures. <laughs> that I've I completely lost control of that sentence. <laughs>